So for our newcomers and um, maybe even our old timers who haven't heard about this, uh, this retreat track for Bosco um, really was that intention to carve out of the conference, which, is, which was traditionally uh, a very heavy practical formation. Um, yes, we offered confession. Yes, we offered great music. Bob and his ministry team has just done such a beautiful job. And we were trying to minister to the heart and the soul. Uh, but I believe and, um, that what we are offering now is, is a deeper, intensive interior formation, which we have thought both personally and even listening to you all, essential, essential. And, um, and actually, the more you, you begin to really look at what Pope Francis, John Paul II started, Pope Benedict, uh, for years they have been saying that the work of catechesis is the work of the Holy Spirit. That was, that was the gift of the whole catechetical, I mean, the whole charismatic renewal. And, um, and this is what we're finding more and more and more. Uh, dare I say that before anything else in our church, what we need is revival in the, in the interior life. We need a revival in the interior life. And I believe that's what Archbishop Cousins is trying to do in the revival of the, of the Eucharist. And if you listen to him, it isn't just about worship of the Eucharist, but it's, it's a communion with Jesus in the Eucharist. And of course, that starts with an, an education of Jesus really is present in the Eucharist, but, um, but he does not want it to stop there. He wants us to continue to bring people into relationship with God, with Christ who is here present so that we can bring people to that fullness of their faith. So this retreat track has is, is really been carved out to help you be formed into becoming contemplative catechist. Contemplative catechist. And I think what Teresa and I have been working on together um, is to maybe... Um, help you to not be afraid of that word contemplative. Teresa's presentation this morning was so eloquent in helping you to see that contemplation is the ordinary, the ordinary goal and aim of your baptismal graces. And John talks about that. We go from grace to grace. So I was really grateful. In the retreat track, there are formal presentations in a three-year cycle um, aimed at helping to form you as a contemplative catechist. They're very intentional. And so uh, this is our second year to run that formal um, formation, okay? So it's three talks on contemplative life, contemplative prayer, contemplative study, contemplative preaching, and then three talks on the spiritual life. And so last year we did the different schools of spirituality. Sister Mary Madeline, who has joined the team, will do a presentation on Thursday on discernment of spirits. And then next year she'll go into the particular examine. Now, I just gave a plug for her talk, which took away a plug for my talk on Thursday. But you let the spirit lead you. Um, she's an exceptional speaker. And, um, and you don't have to come to my talk on Thursday. You could just buy the book. How's that for shameless plug? So if you had to choose between her talk and my talk, I would say go to her talk and buy my book. It's very easy. But she's an exceptional speaker, and I think you'll be, be um, very enriched by what she'll do with the discernment of spirits. So this talk is on contemplative study, contemplative study, how to do it and why you need to do it, why you need to do it. And, and I do want to be clear, you need you need to do contemplative study. If you hope to achieve the faith in their life, if you want to be part of this amazing revival that is going on in the church right now, you have a key component in, in learning how to do contemplative study, okay? Otherwise, we do become that dreadful noisy gong that St. Paul warned us of. And contemplative study has a two-fold objective. Contemplative study has a two-fold objective. It's preparing yourself to announce the good news and preparing them to receive it. 
okay? It's preparing yourself to receive the good news and preparing others to receive the good news. Now that I have everybody who's come in, let's pray. Those were just preliminaries. How about that? So, let's begin in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 10. Verse 13. We are blessed to be present in the presence of Lord who is here. And the whole time I'm speaking to you, he is wanting to speak to you. And so as I'm presenting, don't forget that he is here. And let your conversation be with him because he wants to form you as a contemplative catechist. And he wants to release in you his Holy Spirit that you can change hearts to become disciples. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. For all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then are they to call on him if they have not come to believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard of him? And how will they hear of him unless there is a preacher for them? And how will there be preachers if they are not sent? As scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of the messenger of good news. Lord, you have called us to be this messenger you have called us into this work of catechesis in some facet. And in that call, you make a promise to sustain us in our work. And we have come to this Bosco to offer our work to you, to be formed more deeply in this work, to be more formed in your way, your pedagogy, of making disciples. And let us be attentive to you, Jesus. Let us be carefully attentive to how you preached, how you prayed, how you lived, that we may become another Christ to our people. Mother Mary, we entrust ourselves and our work, our families, the whole world to you. And we place us all into your immaculate heart. And I place these dear people in your heart, dear Mother. Together we pray, all glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the telos, or the goal, or the aim of contemplative study is really to create a space, to create a space in the mind, in the body, and the heart to encounter Christ, the beloved first truth. That's what St. Catherine called Jesus her beloved first truth. Okay, so that's the, that's the game, that's the aim, that's the goal, that's the telos of contemplative study. It's to create a space in our body, our mind, and our soul to encounter Christ, the beloved first truth. In the directory, the new directory, 2020, and we'll be saying new for another hundred years, because that's how we are in the church, right? There is a paragraph I want to draw your attention to, and, um, and it's an important paragraph because uh, it, it has been misinterpreted already, and that concerns me. So the paragraph is number 29, if you're taking notes. 
and you should have gotten a handout. And the paragraph reads like this. Evangelization is not in the first place the delivery of a doctrine, but rather making present and announcing Jesus Christ. Let me repeat that. Evangelization or evangelizing is not in the first place the delivery of a doctrine, but rather making present and announcing Jesus Christ. Now, I am not one to say that the directory has made a mistake. But I have spent the past 20 years of my life professionally, personally, as a Dominican, trying to help people reconcile religious experience and religious knowledge. It was my doctorate question. It is what Petrak and I had been working on <laughs> all the time, though he's always more eloquent. It's, it's what I have found to be a perennial um, problem in catechesis, is this bifurcation between the head and the heart. And if we're not careful, those kind of statements will perpetuate this. It's not about the doctrine. We want them to love God. It's not about the doctrine. We want them to experience God. Now, I'm not taking a poll of which camp you fall in. My work is to try to form you as a contemplative catechist because it's in contemplation it's in contemplating doctrine that the head and the heart become one. Amen? Amen. And if you don't become a contemplative catechist, dear friends, you risk perpetuating and widening this gap of the either or. And it must be a both and. Now, now I, I have a sense of what they were trying to say in that, but I've already heard it misunderstood. As a matter of fact, as my book was going to print and I got the cover, which I, was, I wasn't given beforehand, and I read the cover, the back cover that, that wrote about the book, I, I, I almost passed out because I, I called my editor and I said, Michaela, 20 years of my life is about to get unraveled. We had to stop the presses. And what was that one phrase that somebody in their office thought was a synopsis of my book, my research, my life project, if I dare say that, was catechesis is not so much about handing on doctrine, but about an encounter with God. Now, that might be too subtle for you, and that's okay, because I passed the pass through with my sisters, and only those who went through my catechetical class caught it, because I drilled it over and over and over. Catechesis can never be an either or. It is always a both and. Always a both and. My mind needs intelligible realities with which to contemplate God. He's not a warm, fuzzy feeling, and he's not nirvana. He has come to reveal to us who the Father is, and he came in flesh, that we would see him, yes? And he spoke many beautiful doctrines that we would have insight, something with which to grasp who the Father is. Yes? It's all about the doctrine. It's all about the doctrine. Doctrine is truth. And truth, dear friends, is who he said he was. Yes? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this is what St. Catherine of Siena, I think, revealed for us. It's what seized her when she spoke to him, when she was embraced by him in her mystical unions. 
You are my beloved first truth. And there is nothing sterile about that. But what's happened in our catechesis? We have reduced the Lord to just words rather than using the words to encounter him. We have reduced the Lord to just words, to just doctrinal proclamations without providing for people an opportunity to use those doctrines as an access to his heart, his mind, his presence. We have lost the contemplative dimension to the kerygma, to handing on the gospel. That's what I think has gone wrong. So Dominicans have this great motto, veritas, truth, we have another one, contemplare et contemplata alis tradere, to contemplate and to give to others that which is contemplated. To contemplate and to give to others that which is contemplated. And I think that's a critical element for us and for understanding the Dominican approach. Now, I'm not here to try to make you Dominicans, okay? I mean, I got to, thank you. Some of you were born Franciscans, you live Franciscans, you're going to die Franciscans, I can't do anything about that. And I got my Carmelites too. I got my Jesuits. I'm not trying to make you Dominican, but I am trying to give you a dogmatic spirituality. Because a dogmatic spirituality is a catechist spirituality. Whether you're Dominican, Franciscan, Carmelite, Ignatian, Opus Dei, those are all ways of praying. As a catechist, you need to adopt, to embody, to imbibe a dogmatic spirituality, which means that your prayer is always engaged in the meditation of divine truth. Fair? Can I hear an amen? I checked that out with Petrock many years ago, so that's why I'm standing firm on that. Okay? He was the first one that I was like, oh, yeah, that's, yes, absolutely. And I think he embodies that. His spirituality is the catechism, if you will. Now, he says he's a Franciscan. I know he wears that towel. Is that what it's called? Yes. But, but dogmatic <laughs> spirituality. Okay? Because, because the end of contemplative prayer as the end of contemplative study is the person it's God whom we are cont contemplating. It's God. It's, but, but where is he? I, and I can come to the chapel, yes, and, and I can look at, at Jesus the Blessed Sacrament. Tomorrow I'll have adoration. But, but what do I know about that? Yes, God is dwelling in my soul, but what do I know about that except what Teresa taught us this morning? That's contemplative study, reaching God, reaching God. And all the words in our catechism, paragraph 25 says, all the words of the catechism, the whole concern of doctrine and its teaching must be directed to the love that never ends. Paragraph 25, the love that never ends. That's the goal of doctrine and the teaching of doctrine the love that never ends. So, so if you were present this morning for contemplative prayer, you, you did hear, and, uh, and let's repeat it just a little bit. Um, first and foremost, contemplative prayer is, is God's work. It's his work. It is the spirit who dwells within, so, so we receive the Holy Spirit in baptism. He gave us the theological virtues, infused them in us so that we could be in this conversation with him, that our soul could touch him, could be alive to him. Contemplative prayer is, is God's work. We, but we are, also, we are called to dispose ourselves to that. And we talked a little bit about that this morning as well. 
being still, my body, my soul. <clears throat> and so the same is true um, about contemplative study. So if I, want to, if I want to be able to encounter the beloved first truth that all of these doctrinal proclamations serve as a portal, these doctrinal proclamations are a portal to God, then I have to also prepare my body and my mind for that encounter. Is that fair? Is this making sense? Okay. So, <clears throat> so this physical attentiveness, having a silence of body and mind, is paired with an intellectual attentiveness. My physical attentiveness is paired with an intellectual attentiveness. An intelligent reading, cogitation, a doctrine, whether it's in the form of scripture or the catechism. This feeds contemplative prayer and it feeds my contemplative preaching because what I'm doing now is a contemplative meditation, cogitation, reflection, working these doctrines, not just to prove texts and prove to somebody God is true, but I want to encounter the living God, beloved first truth, so that I may hand him on. Alrighty, so we talked a little bit about silence this morning, but I want to I present a little bit more to you about silence. I, I, I believe that I gave you some on the handout. I want to make sure I've got the handout. Because I didn't do a PowerPoint because I just don't want to do that in the chapel. But this first number two, this quote from Anton Sertelanges, he wrote an excellent book on the intellectual life. And, and what he said is that the word, the word, and you could do a capital W, Think doctrine, word, think Jesus, word. The word has resonance when you hear the silence in it. It hides and leaves you to guess its treasure, releases it bit by bit, without haste and frivolous agitation. Silence is the secret ingredient in the words that count. The value of a soul is found in its silence. So you have been entrusted with the task of making disciples, which is the aim of catechesis. You have been entrusted with the task of proclaiming the kerygma, which is the good news. God is, and you're not him, okay? So he loves you. He has come to save you and bring you to himself. The kerygma has a variety of, of, of expressions to it. But it's, it's the basic proclamation of God is good and he has created you to know him, to love him, and be in relationship with him. I mean, for me, the kerygma is CCC 221. I mean, I think that's the, the heart of everything in the catechism. God is the eternal exchange of love, Father, Son, and Spirit. And he's destined you to participate in that exchange of love. He is love. And he's destined you, he's created you to share in that love. So how are we going to do that? What keeps us away? What becomes the obstacles? What's the way into that divine trinity? I think that's, that's everything in catechesis, but I'm kind of simplistic sometimes. So the word has resonance in us when it's in silence. And so, so if, if I'm preparing my lesson, my catechetical lesson, my catechetical proclamation, I have, a, I have a word to hand on to you, but that word is a capital W word. And I want that word, capital W, to come and resonate in your heart, in your soul. How is that going to happen unless he's in my heart and my soul? And how will that be inside out proclamation if I myself don't take time in silence 
to cogitate, to ruminate, to sit with and seek his face. Through the doctrine, he has revealed himself to me. The bridegroom has spoken to me and the bride, the church, has meditated on that message and has offered to us a beautiful text by which we can have access to his face, his heart, his mind. Amen? Okay. So. Father Donald Haggerty, who I already quoted once, and I'm not going to read this whole quote because it is in your handout, um, but, I, but I love what he writes about in the contemplative hunger. And, and it's, very, it's very challenging to us as catechists because, again, we, we can fall into, or maybe it's just me, <laughs> if I just get the right argument, if I can just explain this well enough as a Dominican, Right? It's like St. Thomas slamming his hand on. That'll settle the Manichaeans. <laughs> Thank you. So, <laughs> so what Father Haggerty is, is challenging us, and, and I'm offering it to you, is this beautiful quote, the rebuttal to every antagonism to religious truth. And we know there's lots of it, right? This antagonizing to, to truth cannot be be mainly by way of intellectual argument. The people that we are serving have been drinking from, from the, the Kool-Aid of Ill, illogic for so long, so many years. This is, this, is, this is a philosophy that has gone bad. There is no truth. And if there is, you can't know it. I mean, you've all heard this, right? This is, this is as old... <laughs> And, and we're, just, we're just seeing the fruits of it. If there's no truth, then there's no gender. So Father Haggerty is pointing out that the rebuttal, it, it, can't, it can't just be on an intellectual level. And yet, truth will set them free. So we need truth, but it's a truth that has an anointing in both its preparation in your soul and in your proclamation. Those of you who were there this morning, raise your hand again. Okay, okay, so there's a number of you. All right. So at the end of that presentation, I asked you for a quick feedback survey. Was your heart stirred? Was there a movement in your will to want to pray more, to seek this contemplative prayer out? In anybody, you don't have to raise your hand, but what you got, what you received was someone who prayed the catechism contemplatively. Teresa's study of the theological virtues wasn't just to give a presentation. It was to bring you into a truth that would set you free and set you on fire. Could you not see that? I sure could. That's what a contemplative does when they pick up the catechism. When they study it, when they deliver it, it changes, it inspires. It's a truth that sets you free and wants you to have more. So Father Haggerty's point about this religious truth is not just an intellectual argument. It is this intensity of certitude of God. And that intensity and certitude of God, while not bypassing the intellect, you'll never hear a Dominican say that. No, 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 no. <laughs> it all is going to come through the intellect in some way whether it stays there or, or, or just fluidly keeps going, 
we are body, soul, mind, will, so. This certitude of God is an encounter of God in prayer that is anointed in the spirit that is the fruit of someone who has contemplated his face and is handing on who they've contemplated. Someone who has contemplated his face through the doctrine, either in the catechism or the scripture, sought his face. Reveal your heart to me, Lord. Help me to know you more. I'm seeking your face. Hide not your face from me. This is, this is contemplative study. I want to know you. And when that moment of, I know you, I don't just know about you, but I know how the theological virtues help me access you. And the conversation goes into a personal dialogue based on the doctrine, it will change the way you proclaim that to someone else. Is this making sense at all? Okay, so. So Father Haggerty speaks about um, nothing tangible supports the act of faith in gazing at a monstrance. Nothing tangible supports that act of faith during adoration. It's, it's truth and an encounter with the beloved first truth, what I have studied, what I've come to know as revealed is what helps me to stay there. The awareness of Christ in silence. The awareness of Christ in silence. So sacred doctrine is not superficial Data. I think that's that's kind of what I keep trying to say is it's it's just not information, though we can reduce it to that, and I believe we have reduced it to that in catechesis. We have been very much concerned about what do they know? Do they know what the church teaches? We've been very concerned about the um, the powerpoints, the textbooks. The quizzes, the tests, the notes. And, and some of that is, well, well, what's the accountability that they actually got it? And I had a sister uh, who was our director of education come at a formal visitation with mother to a school I was teaching at in Chicago, watching me teach my lesson. She said, sister, how do you know that they got it? I said, I don't know unless I see them changing their behavior. Satan can quote scripture better than any one of you. Yes? Yes. It isn't always what's known up here. And just because children are getting A's on tests does not mean they have been converted. But if we continue to make that our aim, this checklist, then we miss the point of the contemplative dimension of catechesis. I want them to know the Lord. That's my goal. Well, how are they going to know the Lord? Well, he has revealed himself in scripture and tradition. I want to know him. And so I'm going to go to the sources of scripture and tradition to meditate on him, to seek his face, in silence, that he can change me and touch me and bring me to a relationship to him, but then I have to do that for my people. So that's a little into the contemplative preaching. So we want our catechesis to be authentically charismatic, okay? 
and for it to be charismatic to set people on fire, we have to keep this wholeness of body, soul, mind, and heart. I, I am myself, myself sitting with the Lord, either at my desk or in the chapel, with the doctrine that I, that I am preparing to proclaim, and I'm talking to Jesus about that. I'm allowing the Spirit to amaze me about that, that particular passage. I'm asking the Lord, why is that necessary for us to know that? Why did you reveal that? What's at the heart of this doctrine? What's riding on it? Why do they need to know it? What will it unlock in their relationship with you? Why do I need to know this doctrine? What is the face that you're trying to reveal to me, Lord? I'm sitting with the Lord in my study, and I'm asking him these questions about baptism, about the virtues, about the Eucharist, about confirmation. Whatever the doctrine you're proclaiming today, tomorrow, the next day, next week, it all has a face to it. It is all a portal to the divine trinity, to the love that never ends. And you're asking, show me, show me, so that I can then hand you on. So, okay. So the, the directory <clears throat> speaks about catechesis. The 2020 directory speaks about the goal of catechesis needing to be reinterpreted. I don't know if, how many of you have read the, the directory yet. It's quite beautiful, actually. And I was told that um, they actually just scrapped it all and started over. <laughs> what is catechesis? What is our work? What are we trying to do? The goal needs to be reinterpreted. So the goal, according to CT5, which Bob Rice maligned last night in a hilarious way, it is intimacy with Christ. That is the goal. But, but what the directory speaks about is it's brought through a process of accompaniment. Accompaniment, each individual must develop his own unique response of faith. So the goal is intimacy through accompaniment. We are bringing our children, we are bringing our adults, our youth, along a journey to this, amen, you are the Son of God, and I give my life to you. That's a journey. That's a process. Each individual must develop his own unique response of faith. Now, that's not saying they come up with their own truth. Okay, this is not hokey pokey stuff. We're not saying that, that they're coming up with their own truth, but their response to that truth. Jesus, the Son of God, became flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary. That's a doctrinal proclamation, yes? And you're proclaiming that to your people. Jesus, the Son of God, became flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary. What is that person? What are you? How are you responding to that? What is it evoking in your mind, in your childhood? Is there opportunity in a presentation on the incarnation for your people to have their own response to that? To ask them, what do you think about that? Now, of course, the three-year-olds will be all over the place, right? And the five-year-olds, oh, well, I just think, you know, my mom, I got a Christmas gift once. You know, I mean, yeah, we get that. 
we get that. But allowing people, so, so the proclamation of, the, of the, the mystery of the miracle, this tremendous gift of God becoming flesh, there's a truth I've proclaimed, but what would be your response? And can I, do I dare trust the Holy Spirit if I give him room to work in silence? Do I dare trust that the Holy Spirit will spark something in the other person? Depending on their familiarity with the story, their experience of Christmas, whether or not you have visual aids that have a picture of Christmas. Those are levels of responses. But dare I let them first have their response to that? And does it have to always be, ooh, 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 I've got the answer? Or just let them sit with that. Maybe there's something, maybe there's nothing, but, but the response has to be their own. So while we're proclaiming doctrine, and I'm meditating on doctrine, I, I am being amazed that the Lord became flesh. And I'm allowing that to amaze me first in my study. I've read that doctrine a million times. I've taught it two million times. But how often has it reduced me to tears? How often has it reduced me to silence of its profundity, of its truth? God became flesh. And has that seized my soul as a catechist to study it, to really sit with it, to let it pierce my heart that God so loved the world that he became as a baby. Vulnerable, weak, innocent. Accessible. and allowing them to have that moment of being overwhelmed. So I'm slipping a little bit into contemplative preaching as I'm doing contemplative study, because it's gonna be two years before I actually give that lesson, but it's okay. So I wanna just um, add a few more things about charismatic catechesis, charismatic catechesis. So the directory, paragraph two, which is also quoted from Evangelium Gaudium 164, 165, a catechesis which manifests the action of the Holy Spirit, who communicates God's saving love in Jesus Christ and gives himself so that every human may have fullness of life. Charismatic catechesis is a catechesis which manifests the action of the Holy Spirit the action of the Holy Spirit. If I have studied the proclamation of the incarnation, if I have truly sat with that in contemplative prayer, it is your face, O oh Lord, that I seek. Overwhelm me with this truth. Let me be amazed by it. Let it grab my soul, my mind, and everything in me. Let it set free, set loose, set a fire, the Holy Spirit within me in that truth. And so now when I'm proclaiming the incarnation, well, those aren't just words in a textbook, are they? 
I have been seized by that reality, by that truth. I've been overwhelmed by it. And my work to proclaim it to you is to allow the Holy Spirit from within me to come to you. So charismatic engagement with doctrine looks like prayer. Charismatic catechesis, which everybody's saying. Evangelizing catechesis, which everyone, it's the buzzword now, right? An evangelizing catechesis, a charismatic catechesis, is prayer. Kiss. Keep it simple, sister. It's prayer. It's prayer. It's prayer. It is your face, O Lord, that I seek. Hide not your face. And he hasn't. He hasn't. And every beautiful doctrine that's in here, every one of them will show you a face of God that should amaze you, overwhelm you, leave you with a wonder of, who am I that you would do all of this? I mean, the story is so radical, really. It, it, it's almost unbelievable that God would go through so much trouble to make us, to redeem us, to speak to us. I mean, really, don't you think? There are parts that I read in here and I think, like, why would you bother with me on all of this? Because I love you. The concern of doctrine is to lead people to the love that never ends. And if you become a contemplative catechist, if your study becomes contemplative, that you're sitting with the Lord, you're seeking his face, you're letting your intellect be enlivened with his truth, if your study becomes contemplative, your preaching will become contemplative. It will have an anointing to it. I am convinced of that. So I did give you um, your little handout, just a little exercise. Uh, you don't have to, but... Um, and I suggested one doctrine, but, but, you, but if you have another one you want to do, go ahead. But I just gave you a little exercise in contemplative study. So what I'm doing is I'm taking you since the year of the Eucharist, and you want to be Eucharistic evangelizers, let's do some contemplative study of the Eucharist. And so go to your primary sources, John 6, the Catechism. They're related sources, so, so I want to enter more deeply into this truth this presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And, and what is my access to that? John 6, the Catechism. The footnotes are beautiful. My personal posture, right? So, so posture, purpose, and prayer, I think those are, are, are it's kind of a nice alliteration. Um, where am I going to study? I've got my Catechism. I've got my notebook. Uh, where will I sit? A lot of times I sit in the chapel my catechism with my little notebook. Um, my desk is a beautiful place. I've got a crucifix there. Nobody else gets to come into my room. <laughs> That's a great thing about being a nun. <laughs> my room is my room. <laughs> and so no one comes in. And so there's a beautiful place there that I can, can, can enter into prayer. I gave you St. Thomas's prayer before study. It's kind of long. I think it's beautiful. But come Holy Spirit. Open my mind to receive the fullness of your truth. Right? There's a simple prayer. Keep it simple. But, but here's something, and I'm just testing it out with you all, because this is kind of what I do. A few questions to ask yourself as you're studying. So as you're reading those passages of the catechism, ask yourself, what, 
What does this doctrine reveal about God's love for me? So I'm reading about the Eucharist. What in there is God trying to say, I love you? I think that's a beautiful question to ask and a very practical question because when all else fails in your lesson, you're trying to get them to know that God loves them. And if you have first encountered that in your study, if it makes sense to you that this doctrine is communicating God's love for you, then you will be more, it'll be more easier for you to communicate that to them. What amazes me about this doctrine? What amazes me about this doctrine? There is nothing dry and sterile about these words. They are as life-giving as the scriptures. If you are reading them and studying them and praying them in the Holy Spirit, what amazes you about this doctrine of the Eucharist? Because if you're amazed by it, that joy will come into your proclamation. Yes? If you're amazed by it, come hook or crook, they'll be amazed by it. And at least, if nothing else, you'll leave them to wonder, what is she seeing in that doctrine that I am not seeing? How does it challenge me? Now, this is just you as you're reading the catechism. How does it challenge me to be more grateful, more faithful to God? How is this doctrine moving me to be more grateful, more faithful. Just a little something. Now, as you do this more and more, it, it's just going to become natural to you as a catechist. Every time you pick up the catechism, this is what you're going to be doing. Come Holy Spirit, help me to, to see this. Help me to fall in love with this. It's going to be natural. Show me your love through this doctrine. What amazes me. It, it will become second nature. As you're studying, pause and ask the question, and I'm using the Eucharist as an example, you're asking God, now you're in dialogue with him. Now you're talking to him as you're studying the doctrine. Now you're talking to him. If you're in the chapel, well, there he is. If you're in your room, where do you think he's going to be? Yeah, he's with you, because he's got his catechist seeking his face. So wherever you are, Ask God, why does it matter that the Eucharist is your real presence? Why does that matter that it's your real presence? And this one I think is very important. What is one thing, one thing that you want me to be sure to say to my students as I proclaim this doctrine? It's his work. It's not your work. It's his work. How often do we ask him, what do you want me to say to these people? I have learned, I have learned, don't open your mouth, Sister Mary Michael, until you sit in the back of the chapel and ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to say? Otherwise, it's just me. And at the conclusion of your time, just thank him for speaking to you, speaking to your heart. Write, write a prayer if you want. Just keep some notes. Okay? Alrighty. Let's end with prayer, and I have a little bit of time for questions.